Hey, what is up everyone and welcome back to another video. In today's video, we will be continuing with the MongoDB crash course. If we take a look at the course outline, we can see that we are now at the section of schemas and relationships. So in today's video, we will be looking at what a document schema is, what are the different data types in MongoDB, how we can model relationships in MongoDB, and then lastly, we are going to take a look at schema validation. So let's dive right into the video. What exactly is a schema? A schema is a model that represents your data in your database. For example, say we have a shop database and this shop database has two collections, our users collection and our products collection. And inside of these collections, we find documents. Each one of these documents has a schema. So if we take a look at the users, the user document over here, we can see that its schema contains the fields name of Jeff, surname, Bezos, email, jeff at gmail.com and date of birth of some date. And on the other hand, we have the products collection that has a product document. And this product document schema has a title field of book, a price field of $12.99, and a details field that has an embedded document that has a field of type paperback. So if we talk about a schema, we talk about the structure of the document inside of the collection. So how this document is structured, that is the schema of this document. But is MongoDB not schemaless, you might ask? Well, yes, going schemaless and just adding documents to a collection where each document has a completely different schema is totally possible. But let's be real, this is not really realistic for any real world application. In our applications, we would like to know how our data looks so that we are able to query it in a later stage. So what are the different schema approaches you can take in MongoDB? First, we can go with the schemaless approach. So this is the one we just saw. The schemaless approach allows you to add documents to your collection where each document has a different schema. This is very unorganized and unstructured, but this is allowed in MongoDB. For example, let's take a look here. We have two documents inside of a collection and the first document has the field of title and a value, a book. The second is a price and of $12.99. Then we can take a look at the second document. This document has completely different fields to the first one. So these two schema are completely different. This one has a name and available. This one does not even have an available field. And here we change the title to name. So this is the schemaless approach. The next approach we can take is the flexible schema approach. Here we have somewhat of a structure where the documents contain most of the same fields in their schema, but some schemas may contain additional fields where necessary. So if we take a look here, we can see that the first document has a field of title and book one and a price of $12.99. The second document ha also has a field of title and book two. So here we can note that the value of the field does not necessarily have to be the same. This can be unique for or different for each document. It's more pointed towards the field names. So here we have title, price. Down here we have title and price as well. But then at the second document, we have an additional field of available equals to false. So this is the flexible schema. The next approach is the strict schema approach. This follows a more SQL world approach where all of the documents has exactly the same schemas containing all of the same fields. So we can say that going from schemaless all the way to strict schema is a more SQL world approach. So this is going all the way to a more SQLish approach. So which approach do you use? Well, this is completely up to you and your application needs. 
this is the beauty behind MongoDB is that it gives you the complete freedom to structure your data in any way you'd like. For any real world application, in my opinion, I would say going for the last two approaches, the flexible schema and the strict schema is a better choice. So next, let's take a look at the data types we have in MongoDB. Looking at data types in MongoDB, we are looking at what types the values in our documents can be of. So this part of the document. So in MongoDB, we have the following data types. We have the text data type, which is some string wrapped in quotation marks. Then we have the Boolean data type, which has a true or false value. Then we have the number data type. So by default, adding a number to the MongoDB shell, it is added as a floating point number. But if we specify it as one of the following number int, it will save it as an int 32 bit number, number long, which will save it as an int 64 bit number, and number decimal, which would save it as a decimal number. Then we have the object ID data type. We've seen this before when adding a document and we do not specify our own unique underscore ID value, MongoDB automatically creates an object ID. This is unique for each individual object and contains some sort of sorting in this temporal string literal. Then we have the ISO date data type, which stores our date in this format. Then we have the embedded document data type, which we've seen before as well, where we give a field name of details and then we add the value of a document data type. So the inside of the document, we can have nested fields that can go up to a hundred levels deep. And each one of these fields can then once again be each of the mentioned data types. And the last data type is an array data type. The same goes for the array data type. The values inside of the array can be of any of the previously mentioned data types. So now that we know the data types in MongoDB, let's see them in action by going to the terminal and starting up a MongoDB server and shell. If you do not have MongoDB set up on your local machine yet, go and take a look at the first video in the series where I go through the installation and setup. So here I'm just going to open my MongoDB server and shell by running the bat file. And if I clear this and say show DBs, we can see I have a clean server. So here I'm going to add a new database called shop by saying use shop. And I'm going to add a new collection implicitly by adding a document into it. So this collection will be named sales. So I can say db.sales.insert1, just like this. But instead of closing the parentheses like this, I'm going to add the document um, curly braces like that and then press control enter. And this will add it to a new line so I can type out the document nicely. So the first field will be sale date. And this would be of type new date. So as the Mongo shell is based off of JavaScript, we can run a new date and this would give us an ISO date data type. The next field will be items, which is part of the sale. And this would be an array. This array will contain documents as its entries. And each one of these documents will have a name. The first one will be printer paper and we'll have a price of $40 not as a string and then a quantity of two and in the next document we'll have a name of notepad and a price of 35 and a quantity of five comma and then the next field will be store location and we can set this to a string of Denver. The next field will be the customer information. This would be an embedded document which contains the gender of male, age of 42, 
an email of a string called john at example.com next field will be a boolean field of coupon used and we'll set this equal to true purchased method will be a string of online then we'll create a timestamp and this once again will just be new timestamp and we'll take a look at what this gives us in just a moment then the last thing I want to add is some random long number and the reason for this is I want to show you what MongoDB does when we add a too long number so we're gonna make this easy by saying one two three four five six seven eight nine and do this again one two three four five six seven eight nine and if we're done we can add this by closing the curly braces and parentheses and then just hit enter this would give us acknowledge true and the inserted ID so if I were to go and view this now, I can say db.sales.find1 as there is only one in the collection currently. And this would print it out in this form. Here we can see the underscore ID field that was created automatic, automatically by MongoDB. And it got the object ID data type. Then we have the sale date. And this is of ISO date in this format and this just prints out the exact date I created this document. Then we have the items field that is an array of documents and each one of these documents has a name, price and quantity. Then we have the store location which is just a string. Then we have the customer details which is an, a document containing the genre, age and email. Then we have a boolean field of coupon used. We have the purchase method as online and then we have this timestamp that was created. And here's the interesting part, the long number. We can see that this long number is not the same as the long number we entered up here. It got cut off at the end. And the reason for this is MongoDB, as MongoDB shell is based off of JavaScript once again, saved this number as a floating point number. And due to some computational limits of the shell, it got cut off at the end. So in order for us to make sure that this number gets saved correctly, we have to save this as a number long data type. So let me quickly clear or drop this collection and re-add this. So I'm going to say db.sales.drop, just like this. And it would just drop the collection. So now if I were to find something, db.sales.find1, it will return null. So I'm going to press up arrow key till I get to the place where I added this document to sales. And this long number I'm going to change, I'm going to wrap it in the number long data type. So I'm gonna say number long, and number long takes in a string of that number. So it's important to add this as a string in the MongoDB shell. And if I were to add this now, uh, I'm missing something here. Okay, so I just typed that incorrectly. It's not number, it's number. And if I were to add this now, we have the acknowledged equals to true. And if I find one once again, just like that, we can see everything is the exact same way. And then the number long, we got the exact number in the correct length and digits that we entered. So when working with numbers, it is important that you read up about which number data type to use if it becomes really, really long numbers or if it is really um, critical that the numbers should be of accurate form. So when working with financial data, you will most likely use the number decimal. I will leave documentations down below so you can read up more about this. So now that we have seen all the data types in action, let's look at how we can model relationships in MongoDB. Okay, so when we think about relationships in MongoDB, we have two options. We have the embedded approach, and then we have the reference approach. So if we take a look at these examples here, we can see that we have some posts collection, and inside of this collection, we have a post document. This document has a caption, a body, and then some comments array. And here we have a relationship between the post and the comments. So if you think about it, one post can have many comments and one comment can only belong to one post. 
So this is a, a kind of a, a relationship between them. So the way we approached it here is by physically Im embedding the comment inside of the post. So for example, we have one comment that has a text of great post. Then we have another comment of text that is nice on this specific post. Where on the other hand, we have the reference approach, which once again has the posts collection and some post document. It has a caption, it has a body, and then instead of placing the entire comment directly inside of this comments array or embedding it, we just reference some ID. So in this situation, we will have a comments collection. And this comments collection will contain all of our comments. And there, we just reference the physical ID or something unique about this comment from the post to the comments collection. So let's take a look at an example of this. Let's start with um, the embedded approach. And this is the most straightforward approach. And believe it or not, we've used this um, in our previous example when adding a sale to our shop database. So let's go back to the shell and check this out. Okay, so now we're back in the shell. We are working on this shop database. So I can just say use shop to make sure we're using that. And here I'm just going to show you by going db sales dot find one. So this is the one entry we added in the previous example. So here I can show you we are using the embedded approach. We are referencing some customer and then just directly embedding this customer's detail inside of the sale. And this can work like this, but it's probably better to use the reference approach when working with this type of relationship as this email may change and this customer customer um, may make a lot of sales and then this is just duplicate data all over the place so if something here would have changed would to change then we have to um, update every single occurrence of this customer inside of the sales field sales collection so let's change this so here we can see the embedded approach in action so let's change this to a reference approach so in order to do this i'm going to delete that entry so i'm going to say db.sales.delete many and then just pass in empty curly braces so this will just delete that one item we have in there so i've just deleted that and now i would like to create a customers collection so i'm going to say db.customers and then here I'm just going to insert one customer. Um, this customer will have a name and we will say Jeff. It will have a surname of Bezos and an email at jeff at example.com. Just like this. And then we can have an age field of 42. And this should be fine for our example. So I'm going to add this. We can see it was added. So now if we want to go db.customers.find1 uh, customers, excuse me. Here we can see our customer being created inside of the customers collection. So we want to reference this customer in our sales um, entry. So I'm gonna up arrow key all the way to the sales entry we created. Here we created the sale. And here we have the customer. So instead of doing it like this, where we embed the customer, I'm going to reference this customer. So I'm going to navigate all the way with my cursor to there, and I'm going to remove this document. And instead of adding this document um, like this, we need something unique from our customer to reference. And what is unique that we have learned? The underscore ID. This should always be unique for each individual document. So I'm going to copy this by selecting it and then just right clicking and then paste it by just right clicking once again in there. So if I do this and I create this document, we can see it was acknowledged. And if I were to go and view this and say sales.find1, as we only have one, here we can see that we referenced this customer. So here we just created a reference type relationship. So this is great. So now all we have to do to get this customer's detail is we need to navigate, we do some query for this sale in this specific ID, and then we navigate to the customer field 
and then we retrieve this object ID. We can take this object ID, I'm going to copy this, and then we can find that customer's details by saying db.customers.find and we can send in a query param. Here we can say that the underscore ID field should be equal to this object ID. And if I were to pretty print this out and say pretty, here we find that exact customer with all its details. So now if I wanted to update the customer's names or um, surname or email or age, I can just do it in this one document right over here and nothing has to change in this customer reference here. So you might ask, but I have to do two queries now to get this. And yes, well, that is true. MongoDB is extremely fast. So this action will not be insufficient at all. I will show you a different way of handling this in a later example using the aggregation framework. So in our sales um, document, we can see another form of embedded document relationship. Did you spot this? Well, this is inside of the items array. Here we physically embed the items details inside of the inside of each one of the items documents. So this approach is totally fine as when you make a sale, um, the snapshot of the data won't need to change that often. So but let's change this into a reference approach as well. So in order to do that, we are going to need a items collection. So instead of deleting the sale, I'm just going to update the sales once we created the items collection. So let's create the items collection. I'm going to say db.items.insertMany. I'm going to insert two items in this database. So I provide an array of items. So this would be two documents. These items will have the following data. Let's say this item has a title of this is item one. It has a price of, okay, let's just make it the same as the, the previous one. So this is printer paper. And this has a price, which is not a string of 40. And the next one, we can have a, a price uh, a item of title and notepad and a price of 35 just like that and if I were to add this we can see there is an error I should actually make this insert many just like that and let's check if we have all our correct braces here's the ending one the price starting one here Okay, so this should work now. If I create this, we can see that we acknowledged um, our right. So I'm going to keep this on the screen because we're going to want to use these IDs of each one that was created. And I'm going to go back to the sales um, collection. So I'm going to say DB dot sales. And here I'm going to say update one. So we only have one collection in our set uh, one document in our sales collection. So let's find the criteria we want to update by. And here we can say, um, let's quickly find uh, this sale so I can get its ID to search by. So here we have the ID. I'm just going to copy this unique ID. And down here we can say db.sales.update1 and pass in where the underscore ID is equal to this object ID. And then we pass in outside of these initial curly braces, we pass in the another curly braces. We'll get to this in the um, read write section. And here I can say dollar sign set and pass in the new items array. So this new items array should have an item which reference the object IDs we have up here. So the first item would be of this object ID and then we can paste it in there. And then we had a quantity field, so I can just say quantity of two. And then in this array, we have another item that had an object ID of the one just below it right here. We can add that and we had a quantity of, I, I think five, yeah, five. So now if you were to add this, we can see that acknowledge is true. 
we matched one, which is this cell over here, and then we modified one. So if I were to clear this and go back and view this cell, we can now see that instead of embedding the item's full data, we have just added it um, in this form. So we have referenced the item. So once again, we can find the item, we can find the sale by its ID, and then navigate into the items array in our code, and then find each one of these item fields in our embedded documents, and then just go to the items collection. So we can say db.items.find, and here we can find where the underscore ID is equal to this object over here. I'm gonna paste it down there and then I can find and here we can see that object being logged with the title of printer and price so this is really um, little amount of data but you see how these two types of relationships work so um, the last thing I want to show you is now you might ask so if I were to use the reference type how do I populate it in one go so let's show you how to do this by looking the aggregation framework and I won't be going into much detail about the aggregation framework I'll leave documentations down below as the aggregation framework requires you to understand the basics of the query language before you start using that so I'm just going to show you that it is possible to do it in one step and let's do that next with another example okay so let's create another example so I'm going to create another database. I'm going to say use bookshop, just like that. So we just created that database. And in here, I want to add two new collections. The first collection I want to add is authors. So I'm going to say authors.insert many. And here I'm going to add two authors. So we pass in an array and we're going to have two documents of the two, these two authors. So here, I want to add an author with a name of Mark and a surname of Zuckerberg. Not sure if I'm spelling that correctly. Uh, let's say an age of 29 and an address of some document that has a city. And here we can say SF and a street of tree street um, I, I don't know any streets in San Francisco um, and then we have another um, author with the name of Bill and the surname of Gates and then the age of I have no idea how old he is so I'm just gonna say like 60 and uh, address of that contains the city and here I'm going to say SF again and then a street of rock and I'm going to add this and here you can see we just created two new authors inside of our authors collection and the next collection I want to create is a books collection so I can say db books dot insert one so I just want to insert one document and here the book will have a title um, this is book one it can have some price let's say it would be 40 and then we'll create a authors array so I'm just going to call this author list and here it will contain all of the authors that helped write this book so if you think about it a book is allowed to have multiple authors and multiple authors can have multiple books so this is kind of a many many relationship so in the authors list i'm going to copy both of these um, authors we just created up there and just add their object id so we are referencing these authors in this author list to this specific book so i'm going to add this here you can see the book being created so if we were to view this by saying books.find1 we can see that this book has an ID, a title, a price, and then the author list. So instead of embedding both of these authors data as these things may change, the age and the address, we just reference them um, in the authors collection. So how do we populate this array so that it contains 
these data pieces. So this is pretty easy with the aggregation framework in MongoDB. So let me show you how this works. We can say DB and then on the books collection, we say aggregate and then we pass in our braces. Then we have an array with another pair of curly braces. And then here we say, say dollar lookup. And this dollar lookup takes in a document that has a from field. This from field is from where does this object IDs reference to. So this object IDs comes from the authors collection. So here we can say authors. And then we have a local field. And this local field reference to this books. So the actual collection we are running the aggregation on. So the books, we are looking at the local field of authors list. So we can add it here by saying author list. And then we have a foreign field. And this foreign field refers to where in the authors collection are we referencing these IDs. So we are looking at the underscore ID field. So we can say here underscore ID. And it's important to put all of these inside of quotation marks. So the next field is the as field. And we want to add the, this data into the books collection as the authors list. So we're going to rewrite this authors list just for the query purpose. So it's not going to change the physical data. It's just going to show you the data better. So here we're just going to say authors list. And if I were to pretty print this now and view, we can see that we have that specific book being logged. And then this author list came populated with both of these authors details. So we did not have to do two queries. This is a join function if you um, look at it in a SQL point. So we joined this author list with the actual data. So this is pretty neat in MongoDB that we can do this. And yeah, so I just showed you how to populate this in one go. So now you might ask, when should I use which type of relationship? And once again, this really depends on your application needs. But a few guidelines when using the embedded type is if you are constantly needing to update the embedded data, for example, in our previous example, we had the customer field where we physically embedded the customer. If you need to regularly update the customer field, it is much better to use a reference approach than an embedded approach. And the reason for this is because with the embedded approach, we sometimes have um, duplicate documents. Sometimes it's okay to have duplicate documents and sometimes it's not. So you just have to plan um, whether your data is going to be updated a lot, then go for the reference approach. And when should you rather use the embedded approach above the reference approach? Well, if you need data grouped together in your application, so if your application needs to load a post and have the comments with it alongside, it's better to use it in this type of fashion so that it's much quicker and easier to access your data from queries. So once again, when planning your database, I think it's really important to plan your database by doing something like an ERD diagram or just physically sitting down, drawing and planning what your data will look like and where you will be needing your data, how you will be querying your data from your um, front end application and all of these type of things. So it's not a set that you have to use the embedded or have to use the reference. Once again, MongoDB is extremely flexible for you to use any of these two. When it comes to the embedded document, I mentioned this previously, uh, briefly uh, in, in the previous sections that you can only have a hundred levels of nested documents in a document. When we think about it, a hundred levels is a lot. So you would actually never like do that in my opinion. But when looking at the size of a document, a document may only be 16 megabytes of size. So a single document can only have a size of 16 megabytes. So if your embedded document approach um, is going to cause that your document has a larger size than 16 megabytes, then it might be better to use the reference approach instead. So 
Now that we're done looking at relationships in MongoDB, let's go look at schema validation. Okay, so what is schema validation and why do we need it? Schema validation allows us to limit the flexibility of how the document schemas are allowed to look when we enter it into our collection. So basically how this works is we have some right action to a collection. And this collection is then validated with our schema. And this validation schema can either accept the document we just entered into the collection or it can reject this document we entered and do nothing to our database. So um, we would do this when working with real-world applications to make sure that the data types and all of the fields that are required gets passed in with the right action. So I'm going to go over to Visual Studio Code. Okay, so in here I'm going to explain and show you how schema validations work. On the left here, I have an example of how I would like a user to look in our database. It should have a name, an age, a hobbies, which is an array of embedded documents, and it has title and description, and then an address with its embedded document that has a city and a street, and then a net worth that is this extremely long number. So how would I go about adding schema validation to a document? So we will go to the shell in just a second and create our users data database and then add this to a users collection. But first let's create our schema validation. And on this side, I just created a JavaScript file and named it users uh, validation. This just makes the typing easier than in the shell. And I'm just going to copy this and paste it into the shell. And this gives us nice formatting so we can see. So in here, instead of creating a collection implicitly, here you create a collection with the db.createCollection method in MongoDB. So here we say db.createCollection. And this method takes in a name for this, for this collection and we're going to call it users. And then it takes in a document. This document, we pass a validator, and to this validator, we pass an app another document. This first field, we have a dollar sign JSON schema. So we are validating according to a JSON schema. And in here, we can pass in BSON type and set this equal to object. So what this means, for each schema that comes into our database, so for each right action to our database, it should be an object. So if you can see on this side, this is an object. If I were to close this, this object is what we enter into the database. So we would like whatever is entered to be of the form of a document. And the next field we can add is required. And this is an array of strings. And this just specifies what is the fields that we would like this document to contain. And we can enter in here name, age, and these should be strings, hobbies, and address, and then net worth. And then below this, we can add the properties field. And this properties field takes a document. And here we can specify more detail of the fields that we added up here. So we can say name and pass it a document and say this should be of BSON type and we can say strip. And then we can add a description that says this should be of type string and is required. Just like that. The next one we can add is age and once again a BSON type and this this age BSON type will be of type int so we would specifically specify that this is going to be a number int in MongoDB shell and we can add the same description and just change a few things so I'm just going to copy that and paste it down here and this should be of type int and is required as well and then the next one is the hobbies. And this is going to be of BSON type array. And in here, 
we can specify a few different things. So I'm just going to copy that description again and say this should be of type array. And when we work with arrays, we can say another field called items. And this contains a document and we specify whatever the documents or the items inside of the array is, we can specify how they would look. So we can say BSON type and they are of type objects. If, like we can see over here, this is an object that contains these fields. And we can paste this down here, it should be of type object. And then down here, we can add required. So these objects need the following fields. It needs the title and it needs a description just like on this side we have here. And then we can add the properties for this object. Then we can add the title and give it a BSON type of string and a description the same as the one we copied. Then we have a description field and this would be of BSON type string as well and then we can add the description that we copied above. So this would be our hobbies array. So our hobbies array is of type array. Then the items inside of this array will be of type object. The, the fields required in this object is the title and the description. And then we can set the properties for these fields. The title should be of type string and the description should be of type string. Okay, so let's continue to the next one. Let's just get to that ending curly braces. And then we have the address. And this can be of BSON type object once again. So here you kind of see the, the format you take. So here we can just change this to object. And in here, we can add the required fields. And this should have the city and a street and if I'm going through this a bit fast I'll leave this in a github repo so you can just view this um, okay in the next one we have the properties for this object it is the city and the city is of BSON type string so this is the same as the previous and we can have a description then we have a street which is of BSON type string once again. And we can add the description, paste it in here. Okay, so here we have the address field completed. So we navigate outside of that curly braces. And the next one, the last field is the net worth field. And in here we can specify it's JSON, a uh, BSON type of um, long, because this is an extremely long number and we're working with money we can actually set this to decimal but for this example i'm just going to use long and then copy this down and say this should be of type long okay with that with this done we just created our schema validation for the user's collection so let's copy this i'm going to copy all of this and then i'm going to head over to the shell here i am in the shell and let's create a new database. I'm going to say use user data. And in here, I'm going to paste whatever we copied from our text editor. So just like that, uh, the DB create collection users inside of our user data. And we can see that it printed out a message OK when we pressed enter. So if I were to go and say db.users.find1, we will see nothing because we haven't entered anything yet. So if I navigate back to my text editor, I'm going to copy this JSON structure we have over here for our user. I'm going to copy that and go back to the shell. And here I'm going to say db.users.insert1. And once again, I'm just opening the curly braces like that and pasting it in here and then closing the curly braces. And important to note, this will give us a right error and I just want to show you this because this would show that our schema validation is working because this net worth we did not specify as a number long 
and this age we did not specify as a number int. So if I were to enter this, we can see we get two right errors. It does not specifically tell you where the error is, but it just tells you document failed validation. And then once again, below here, it says document fail validation. So in order to fix that, we can clear out here and do the exact same thing. We can say db users dot insert one. We can actually up arrow key. We don't have to do that up arrow key and here in the net worth we can add this as a number number long and remember number long takes in a string and then we can navigate all the way to the age field and add this as number int and once again as a string and if we were to add this now we get acknowledged equals true and we got the inserted document. So if we were to say db users dot find one, we can see that this document was successfully added after validating with our schema. So this is how schema validation works in MongoDB. So this is the end of this video. I really hope you found this video helpful. If there's something you did not understand, please leave a comment down below and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Leave this video a thumbs up and if you're not subscribed yet, you may remember to subscribe for more content just like this. Thank you and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.